Hey guys, I am so excited to announce that the movie that you've been waiting for, the documentary Dr. Patient, is now available for rent or purchase at drpatientmovie.com. Check out the trailer here. When I really knew something was wrong was when I started having trouble walking up the stairs. I was supposed to be grateful and happy and healing and well and thriving, but I did not feel that way. I was so sick. Like always, I wanted to find an answer and I had to figure it out, and I had to figure it out to save my own life. So I dove in. Jill is the leading voice in biotoxin illness and chronic conditions that are driven by toxicity. Oh my gosh, you're dealing with mold? You have to work with Dr. Jill Carnahan. Dr. Jill was the first person that actually began to shed some light on the problem. What I do is listen to the patient and we together talk about what else is possible. I don't know why I'm crying. <laughs> she saved my life. The deepest lessons and most profound insights come in the suffering, come in the dark moments. Self-compassion is the healing transition that, that shifts something inside of us. It's actually the thing that we need most in order to heal. Dr. Patient. Available now at drpatientmovie.com. Welcome to Resiliency Radio, your go-to podcast for the most cutting-edge insights in integrative and functional medicine. I'm Dr. Jill, your host, and in each episode, we dive deep into the heart of healing and personal transformation. Join us as we connect with renowned experts, thought leaders, and innovators who are at the forefront of medical research and practice, empowering you with knowledge and inspiration and aiding you on your journey to optimal health. Now, before I introduce our esteemed guests, I just want to be sure and announce it is here, you guys, my documentary, which I've been working on for the past two years, Dr. Patient is out. It's available for rent or purchase online at Dr. Patient Movie. Dot com. Uh, please listen, share with your loved ones, anyone who's been through a healing crisis. You will find, um, even through the trailer, that I go deeper than I've ever gone in the vulnerability of healing and really how that looks. You're going to see parts of me you've never seen before. So be sure and check that out, drpatientmovie.com. Okay, now without further ado, I want to introduce my guest, Dr. Evan Hirsch, also known as the Energy MD, is a world renowned energy expert best-selling author and professional speaker. He's the creator of Energy MD Method, the science-backed, clinical-proven, four-step process to resolve chronic fatigue and long COVID naturally. We're going to be diving into that today. So any of you who have ever experienced fatigue, raise your hands. I think that's probably 100% of you. Uh, we're going to be diving into the four-step process and some other really tips and tricks for those long, chronically ill patients, whether it's you or a loved one. Through his best-selling book, podcast, and international online platform, he's helped thousands of people around the world. He's been featured on TV podcasts and summits, and when he's not in the office, you can find him singing musicals, dancing hip-hop, and playing basketball with his family. Welcome, Dr. Hirsch. Jill, thanks so much for having me on. You're welcome. Um, gosh, I want to dive right in, but before we do, I always love the backstory, uh, which is like how, why we do what we do, right? Tell us a little bit about how your journey began into medicine and then how you got to be the energy MD. So my journey into medicine was actually, you know, I was good at science and I wanted to help people. And I grew up in New Jersey and uh, I grew up with a very holistic mom, but I had never met a naturopath or a chiropractor. And as far as I knew, the only way to help people was going to be uh, becoming a medical doctor. Now, I did learn about uh, doctor of osteopathy, DO school, and I did apply to DO school, but I never heard back from DO school. So I ended up going to MD school. Um, but that was kind of my path. And along the way, I just asked a lot of questions and I kept asking questions. And the more questions that I asked, the more I realized that uh, allopathy did not have a lot of answers. So I had to keep searching. And so I actually was board certified in holistic medicine, did my first in, in during a um, residency. And I did my first um, uh, hypnosis 
a training session while I was still in medical school. And then I came out and I started my practice and I uh, graduated residency. And while, and while I was doing residency, I was actually doing acupuncture on some of the uh, the normal medical beds that we had, which was quite uncomfortable, but they allowed me to do it during residency, which was nice. And then I came out of residency and I, and I did my first functional medicine training, started practicing. Um, all that to say, when I started my residency, I met my wife, we fell in love, and three months later, she couldn't get out of bed, and she had fatigue. And the fatigue lasted for about three years, and this was on 2005, 2004, actually, and um, and there just really wasn't much going on back then. We had the Adrenal Fatigue book by Dr. Wilson, but um, most of the people that she saw really didn't have a clue about how to help. Now, she got mostly better. We can talk about how, how she did that. Um, but then um, we got married and I graduated from residency and we had a child and I started my practice. And then a couple of years later, I got chronic fatigue and it lasted for about five years just about destroyed my life, just about destroyed my relationship. She's still not 100%. She's like, hey, can you help out at home? We've got this new child. I can't play with my child because I'm too exhausted. I can't help out at home because I'm too exhausted. At work, I feel so much shame because I have fatigue and I'm practicing functional medicine and I'm practicing on myself and I can't help myself. I can help others, but not just not with fatigue. And I'm like taking naps underneath my desk and finally realized that i had to i had to go back to the drawing board and i knew from my functional medicine training that if i knew the causes that i had that i would be successful and so i went on a journey of finding all the causes and inevitably i had to go into environmental medicine and learning about heavy metals and chemicals and molds and infections including lyme and then trauma uh, in order to get myself well i wrote a book about it and now i've helped lots of people and that's become my mission Oh, Dr. Hirsch, you hit on so many beautiful themes that I want to just touch on before we go on, because there's a story there that's common to a lot of people. First of all, the curiosity you had, um, that to me is the driver. I mean, there's studies that show curiosity. I've said this before, it's connected to genius and you and I may not be geniuses, but that curiosity definitely is a driver. You probably are. I just speak for myself. <laughs> I didn't mean that like that. I just meant that like, I, I'm not <laughs> assuming I'm a genius, but I know that that curiosity, right? Like that is the driver as mm -hmm. you were in allopathic medicine, same with me, so similar of a journey, just saying, okay, what if, or what about this? Or why not this? Or, you know, I think it's really a, a, a mind that goes into medicine with curiosity that comes out saying, Yes, there's wonderful things there for trauma and heart attacks and all the those kinds of things. But when you deal with chronic complex illness that have to do with environmental toxins and infectious issues and the things we'll talk about today, the answers in conventional medicine are kind of slim, right? They're incredibly limited. Yes. And I'm definitely far from a genius. And Jill, please call me Evan. Oh, thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Um, well, and I just know I'm like Dr. Hirsch is my dad. He's a he's, <laughs> he's a PhD, you know, and I operate online now. And yeah. so I, I tell people not to call me a doctor anymore because I'm operating online as a coach. So, OK, awesome. Evan, and you can call me Jill, too. Same thing. Cool. So <laughs> curiosity is really um, and it's funny how unique it is. I mean, all of us in this world of function medicine have some sort of curiosity. But a lot of our colleagues, I'm always surprised that they're like, well, if it wasn't taught in medical school, then it must not exist. That idea. Right. right? And I know patients listening can relate. Now, the second theme I heard you say was, unfortunately, your wife got ill and then you got ill. And so often those of us in this field have experienced very personal loss, suffering, illness, and we kind of come up against what the limitations of our training are, right? And you definitely had that piece as well, first with your wife and then with yourself. And then thirdly, and then I'll let you talk, is um, this idea that as a professional, so often um, we think we have to have all the answers, right? And I remember years and years ago, even after my cancer, speaking on stage and saying, oh, I did this and I beat cancer. And uh, and I had this story all tied up with a neat bow. But the truth was I was still st suffering from fatigue, but I didn't let on that I was like not just tied up in a bow and everything's healed and done, but that I'm still in the journey every day to stay well. And then I came across mold. And what I realized in that, this is about 10 or 12 years ago as I was speaking, that piece of being in the journey, on the journey with our patients is so powerful because the empathy it creates not only in ourselves, but in our patients and our clients and our, your coaching clients and your readers and all those people that are in your world, they know, Dr. Evan knows, like he understands he's been there. And I think that's so powerful because those lessons we learned in illness 
I think teach us more than any textbook, right? It provides so much compassion, you know, things that we understand that other people can't, um, you know, just from being in there, just from having to drag yourself out of bed and and go about your day because you have to provide for your family and take care of yourself, you know, so absolutely. And yeah. one of the things I wanted to mention in terms of, you know, my story with like kind of getting together with my wife, that's always so interesting is that, you know, one of the things is that we found that there was mold in her home, which is now our home. But the other thing, too, is the swapping of infections. You know, when you get together with somebody, you're kissing with them, you're intimate, you know, you can swap infections. And it's very common for, you know, when you're looking at the history where, you know, if people say, you know, this is the moment that I know that I got sick. It's like, how is that in relationship to some of the people that you've been with? You know, and it's very interesting to kind of look at that correlation. Oh, yes. Very important. Let's start there because we were going to say, we'll go right to the depth of a mold and, and infection <laughs> really at the core, infectious burden, toxic environmental insults are so core to fatigue. Let's just talk to give us a framework of why infections and toxins might be part of the fatigue. So it's really important to remember that, you know, when you're talking about energy and energy function, we're talking about the mitochondria, energy production. The mitochondria is found in every cell in the body except for red blood cells, produces about 70 to 90 percent of our energy, and it can be significantly damaged by what I call the toxic five. So these are heavy metals, chemicals, molds, infections, and trauma. So all of those things are significant stressors on the body. They damage the mitochondria. That's me smashing the mitochondria. And so in terms of bringing the mitochondria back online and increasing the energy, you need to kind of inject it with good, good love to kind of get the mitochondria to increase production and increase the number of mitochondria in the body. And then you have to remove the toxins off of the mitochondria. Now, that's one component of energy and fatigue. And then the, the other components are some of the other deficiencies which are also caused by the toxic five. So we've got deficiencies in hormones. You know, the adrenals give up, give us our get up and go in the morning. They are, are anti-inflammatory. They create our circadian rhythm and they are the sentinel gland in relationship to like thyroid and sex hormones. There's vitamins and minerals that get deficient from the toxic five. So it's just all those different components end up decreasing our energy. But the big picture is, you know, a lot of people, you know, come to see us. I know you work with similar population where they've been seeing other practitioners who are replacing their deficiencies and they're feeling a little bit better, right? You know, you can definitely replace the adrenals and the mitochondria and vitamins and minerals and all these things, and you're going to feel a bit better. But the reality is, is until you remove those toxic five out of your body and out of your life, you are not going to get, those are the real root causes in you're not going to get all the way better. Uh, I love that you say that because of course I deal a lot of mold patients and that's one of those things that until I really experienced, talk about personal experience, I knew of it. I knew in the background, but when I went through that with toxic mold, I realized, oh, wait, this is a huge thing for myself and my patients and nothing's going to happen. No amount of supplements, no amount of diet, no amount of lifestyle changes, no amount of positive thinking or sleep even will reverse that unless I get that out of my body and out of my environment. Um, maybe we just dive in first to mold because that's a big one. Um, and sure. and what was your experience with that? What's your experience with patients? Because it's kind of the elephant in the room in many cases. Yeah. Well, I mean, my personal experience was that we had a moldy porch and it wasn't until we actually removed that or I actually did testing in the home and had somebody in, uh, you know, a mold expert to kind of take a look at our home as well. We got rid of uh, a front loading washer you know, clothes washer, you know, cause they get, they get really moldy. You really can't keep those clean. So there were a number of things that we did that were really significant. And then over time by taking binders and glutathione, I got the rest out of my body. My, my daughter, actually, she was going to school at a Waldorf that had mold in the basement. And so we actually donated, um, air filters that got down to the 0 0.003 microns that are needed for mycotoxins to the school to kind of protect her a little bit while she was there. And I tried to give her some binders on her way to school and stuff like that. But it was really interesting when we did our, our mycotoxin test later that we could see the, the mycotoxins that we got from the environment that we shared and then the mycotoxins that she got from school. 
so that was kind of um, the the experience that my whole family had. And and over time, we saw the mycotoxin levels go down. Now, in terms of my clients, it is that elephant in the room. And oftentimes, people, even people listening to this still now are like, nah, mold's not a thing, or at least not for them. But the reality is, is that when you have chronic fatigue or long COVID, when you've gotten to this place where your body has kind of called to quits and is like, okay, I need to go to sleep now, or I need to be, I need to rest all the time. It means that there are toxins that have built up in your body. It means that you have a combination of the toxic five, the heavy metals, the chemicals, the molds, the infections, and the trauma. And you have all of those. I actually the, you know, the longer that I do this, the less I test. I actually don't test those things anymore besides whether or not somebody's living in a moldy environment because 10 out of 10 times with all the people that I work with, they have all of those things. And when I used to do testing like every three months, sometimes it would come out, sometimes it wouldn't, but inevitably all of those things would come out all of the t uh, over time and they all have to be addressed. So that's kind of the elephant in the room. Yes, you do have mold. Yes, you do have these other toxins. You may have had mold when you were five years old. You may have lived in a place that had water damage, some sort of busted pipe, a leaky roof, whatever, and you had significant exposure and it's it hasn't been removed out of your body because you haven't done the things that you need to. And then all those things accumulate, all those toxins accumulate over time. And eventually there's a straw that broke the camel's back, but it's been this entire picture ever since you came out of the womb and you had hundreds of chemicals that were already in your body just from coming out of the womb from mom. So really important to understand that whole picture. Hey everybody. I just stopped by to let you know that my new book, Unexpected, Finding Resilience Through Functional Medicine, Science, and Faith is now available for order wherever you purchase books. In this book, I share my own journey of overcoming life-threatening illness and the tools and tips and tricks and hope and resilience I found along the way. This book includes practical advice for things like cancer and Crohn's disease and other autoimmune conditions, infections like Lyme or Epstein-Barr, and mold and biotoxin-related illness. What I really hope is that as you read this book, you find transformational wisdom for health and healing. If you want to get your own copy, stop by readunexpected.com. There you can also collect your free bonuses. So grab your copy today and begin your own transformational journey through functional medicine in finding resilience. Oh, I couldn't agree more and actually love that you said um, no testing because I think when I see online, people are all worried about uh, mycotoxins in the urine and testing and saying, this is the end all be all, go get a test. And you and I as clinicians know that it's not just like there's an excretional component. There's a whole lot of other factors and all of the tests that we have for any of these topics, none of them are perfect. In fact, they're quite mm -hmm. far from it, right? Do you mm -hmm. want to just dive into, you mentioned the five and I'm sure people are really interested. I, like I said, I couldn't agree more with how you're approaching it, just assuming that we're all toxic and that we all have to deal with this. But do you want to just briefly go down the five and talk about each one, just a little bit about how you might approach it? Um, and maybe you approach it as a whole, but just tell us a little bit about your approach to the top five. Absolutely. Well, in order to talk about the top five, I'm just going to talk about my four-step process yeah. cursor, okay. cursorily shortly. Um, so the, the first step of my four-step process, the energy MD method is to figure out the causes that people have. Um, and 90% of these can be determined by symptoms and history alone. And then the second step is to replace the deficiencies, kind of some of those that we talked about. Now, this process really is all about removing the toxic five, but in order to do that successfully, I do find that replacing the deficiencies make people more robust. These are the, some of the lifestyle habits, you know, making sure there's there's enough good food, good water, good sleep, good movement, though most of the people that I work with really can't move much, which is okay. Um, because they're so fatigued. And then it's replacing the adrenals, the uh, mitochondria and the thyroid, et cetera. But those three, I call the big three because they make the most significant shift in people's energy when they're optimized. Um, they'll also help you deal with any of the die off that ends up happening in step four when you start to remove these toxins and it's hard on the body. 
And then step three is opening up the, the de detox pathways or the drainage pathways. These are the exit pathways in order to get the, the toxins out of the body. These are opening up things like the liver and the kidney and the lymph and the lymph in, that's in the brain and the gallbladder and the um, intestines. So all those different pathways that need to be open so that when you go into step four and you start removing each of these toxins, they have a place to go. Otherwise, you're going to feel worse. So anything you want to say about that before I jump into each of those toxic five? Well, I love that because many people aren't talking about the pre-treatments, uh, which is your steps one through three, right? Because when you don't deal with the nutrient depletions or the exit pathways, people get stuck. They feel terrible. They quit the program. And I've seen that a hundred times with people coming from other practitioners or whatever. So I really, really want to just emphasize to patients, it's not all about just go and take a bunch of binders and glutathione and tell you deal with those other things. Um, so thank you for making that a point so important. Yeah. And I think that it's really so much of this is about setting up expectations, you know, like, um, all of our programs used to be 12 months. They still kind of are. We do have a starter program to for three months just to get a taste of who we are and what we do. But the reality is, is that everybody who goes through the, the program is going to need at least 12 months. And it, the magic really happens at like month six or month nine when you actually remove uh, a, a mass, a, you get the mass effect. When you're removing a number of the toxic five, all of a sudden things start clicking, right? But you have to you have to keep coaching people all along the way. Like, yes, you're not going to feel better. Yes, you're not going to feel well. Yes, you're not going to feel better. And then all of a sudden they start to feel better. So it is setting up those expectations so people realize, oh yeah, you're not going to feel better in the first month, two, three, four, whatever. Um, so yeah, that's been that's been a bit, big part about this work as well. And I want to just repeat that for those of you listening, because I've been in, these, on, in these online groups and watching the mold toxicity do the Lyme, those groups, and over and over and over again, people are complaining. They just found mold two months ago, they're starting treatment, they don't feel better. For me, same thing. It was minimum six months till I started to shift at all. I mean, I got rashes, head to toe hives because I was doing it too quickly, right? <laughs> too much mast cell activation. And uh, for two months, I had head to toe hives. I was a mess, but I kept pushing and I felt horrible. And it, I wasn't even close till six months till I started to get the glimmer that something might be turning around. My skin started to clear just a little. And I would say more like 12 months till I really started to have the energy of return, 18 months till I started to feel maybe 50 to 80% better. And I love that we're framing that for people because if you're listening out there and you're in three months in and you're like, not this is not working. My practitioner's not doing the right thing. It might be just time. So thank you for saying that, Kevin. Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, you know, it's, yeah, that's so important. And I, I find that people have to be out of, you know, out of their um, moldy environment for about six months, having been taking binders along the way in order to notice a significant difference, you know, but yeah, and it is beyond, you know, like I said, minimum 12 months. And so, you know, that's hard for people to hear sometimes, but, um, you know, like this didn't happen in a day. And you, you make this investment now, it's kind of like doing a master's degree in your health. You make the investment now, and then you have the rest of your life to enjoy. You know, I know for me, I actually was considering not going, not doing my residency because I came out of medical school and I knew what I wanted to do. And I wanted to practice more natural medicine, more integrative medicine. And I'm glad I did residency, even though it was really challenging. But that th those three years kind of gave me the opportunity to, you know, it gave me a knowledge base that I was able to use moving forward that just gave me a lot more confidence in, in my career. So, you know, you make that investment now and then you have all the benefits for the rest of your life. I uh, love that. And again, there, I talked to a lot of practitioners and not very many of them are really telling people how realistically this does take time. There's a lot of those programs out there, six to eight weeks and you'll be better. And I just think that's a disservice to people because it's not mm -hmm. honest when you're really sick. Now, before we go to the top five, we've been baiting people, but I wanted to go <laughs> The detox pathways, this is so important. And at least for me, allopathically MD, you know, I did not learn this except for my naturopathic friends, but I'd love for you to talk a little bit about practical ways to lymph and kidney and gut and liver, and maybe some practical tips that people might be able to do without seeing a doctor or whatever, uh, just to help those pathways. Cause that's so crucial. Yeah. So the the fastest way there is actually through water, right? So consuming three liters of water a day, 
Now you do want your water to be as clean as possible. So I do like it to be filtered. If you go to ewg.org slash tap water, T-A-P-W-A-T-E-R, you can put in your zip code and you can see just how nasty your tap water is. And you're gonna to wanna to get a filter right away. So even just like a countertop aqua sauna, is uh, is a really is a really good way to go. I do prefer distillation if we're really concerned about the water, um, but block carbon filtration um, can definitely work as well. I'm I'm more resigned about um, or I have reservations about reverse osmosis because oftentimes it's sitting in water, so it can get really moldy, um, and so that has to be cleaned a lot more. You have to actually take it out of the housing in order to clean it, so it's a lot more challenging. But the first place to start is water. Um, and just working slowly up to consuming more water. If you do have a bit of a taste for sea salt or you can tolerate it, putting in some sea salt as much as you can tolerate is actually going to be really good for your adrenals. It'll increase the osmotic gradient and it'll increase the blood flow to your brain, which will end up giving you some more energy. So if you feel worse, headaches, swelling, or something like that by doing the sea salt, then don't do that. But the water is the first place to go. And then the other thing is food. So food will naturally detoxify if you're removing foods that are more toxic. So it's more about, I like to tell people what you can eat. So I think if you eat protein and vegetables with a little bit of fruit, that's kind of ideal for most people. So, you know, half your plate at every meal should really be vegetables. Um, that's what I find. Everybody, you know, you can tweak. I do recommend playing around with different um, diets or food plans, but removing gluten and dairy and soy and corn and chocolate and alcohol and sugars and processed foods, you're just going to, you're going to cause, um, you're going to have a little bit of a detox reaction potentially where you feel a little bit worse um, for maybe a week or so, but then you notice a significant improvement in your energy and your mood, et cetera, that seems to work really well for people. So those are, those are two things that you can do right away. And then movement, you know, the lymph system is the only system in the body that doesn't have its own pump. So it does require movement. And so this could just be a walk every day. This could, you know, it's whatever you can tolerate, you know, most people love dancing. And so just dance every single day to your favorite song. It's going to be three to five minutes. And as long as it doesn't wipe you out and make your fatigue worse, it's a great opportunity. And then sing at the top of your lungs. And that's really good for your nervous system, right? And your vagus nerve. So uh, those are just some, some really quick tips that uh, people can get started on right away. Oh, I love that. Um, I had a patient the other day who was diagnosed with early Parkinson's and was talking about dancing and some doctor had told her to do very specific cardio, you know, stuff. And she was, I could see her face light up when she talked about the dancing and granted it maybe wasn't the most evidence-based exercise for the Parkinson's. But when I saw her <laughs> face, I wrote down on a script, I said, you go out salsa dancing because I saw that joy and that joy factor that brings like, I just saw it on her face. And she was like, they want me to do this and this and this, and I don't want to go to the gym. I'm like, go dancing, right? It might not be perfect, but it's good. <laughs> so I actually love that you said that. And I know you have a background from our <laughs> in this hip hop. I someday we'll have to go hip hop or you can teach me. <laughs> I love that. Um, okay, onward, on to the five toxin um, uh, areas that we can address. And let's talk about those. Yeah. So the first one is heavy metals. And so, you know, once again, this is an, this is a toxin that accumulates throughout our lives. We get it from mom through the placenta. I ate a lot of tuna fish growing up. I had mercury fillings. Both of those things ended up increasing my mercury, you know, exposure to lead, to cadmium, to, um, to tin, you know, all of these things accumulate um, over time and end up, you know, being neurotoxins and contributing and distracting the immune system so that it can't focus on what it's supposed to be doing, which is removing toxins and especially infections out of the body. And all these, you know, the heavy metals, the chemicals, the molds, they all end up distracting the immune system, which makes a lot of these infections that may be already, may be in balance become out of balance and end up becoming opportunistic. So that's the heavy metals. We're exposed to about over 100,000 tons of 
of uh, mercury through mercury vapor through coal plants that end up getting um, over the oceans, getting into all of the seafood, unfortunately, everything that's coming out of the ocean now has mercury in it. If you are going to eat fish, I recommend eating the smaller fish, the better anchovies and sardines. I actually don't really eat much of any fish. You know, if we do end up having some salmon, it's like once a month, maybe once every other month. And then oftentimes I'm taking something in order to bind up any of the exposures that, that we would potentially have. So that's heavy metals. And then in terms of chemicals, you know, over time, this number has just been increasing, but now I believe it's up to like 89 or 90,000 different chemicals that we're exposed to on a regular basis. There's like 550 different chemicals that women are exposed to before they leave the house in the morning. A lot of that has coming from the cosmetics. And now with the nanoparticles, you know, there's, it's like, it's like getting um, significant more, uh, significantly worse because we're getting more exposure, getting uh, absorbed deeper into the body. Um, so these chemicals are uh, plastics and pesticides that we're being exposed to every time we're not eating organic food. And even eating organic food, there's there's always some blowover from some of the non-organic farms. And so you are getting some pesticides from those as well. Um, and like I mentioned, the plastics and the BPAs and all these different products, you know, and if it says BPA free, but it's still plastic, you're, you know, there's, it's a different kind, maybe it's BPC or one of those other ones, you just want to avoid it the best you can, you want to choose glass over plastics, remember all the plastic that we microwaved back in the 80s and the 90s, right, all of those things went into our bodies, I remember driving cross country, I drove cross country like six times, took six different routes. And I had, I always had a plastic water bottle next to me um, that was being baked by the sun. And then I would drink it, right? I was just kind of mainlining the, the plastics in there. So that's heavy metals and chemicals. And then the molds, you know, the stats are generally 50 to maybe 60% of all buildings in first world countries have water damage. And most of those have mold and then other um infections, biological agents associated with that, that end up triggering a number of the different symptoms that we have. You know, it can be a roof leak, it can be a busted pipe, it can be a flood in the basement, and it can be any place you've ever lived that ever had any of those, right? So it's really important to remember that, oh yeah, you lived in this old home, or even if you lived in a new home, have you driven around town when they're building new homes? It's raining, right? It's raining and they're building this home and you see it, it's all wood. And what happens the next day that it's that it's dry and, and clean, they just you know slap everything together and they make it really tight. So all of a sudden now you have an environment that's wet and warm, right? And so it's perfect for mold. Um, and so it doesn't always mean if you have a new place that it's free of mold, it still has to be tested. You still have to have it evaluated. So that's heavy metals, chemicals, molds and infections. And so in terms of infections, you know, we've got viruses, we've got the new virus and the spike protein, we've got um, uh, some of these bacteria and some of the bacteria that change shapes like Borrelia and Bartonella and, and Babesia, like some of these Lyme type infections, we've got parasites, all of these can become opportunistic when you have some of the other toxins, including trauma, which we haven't even gotten to yet. And all of them can really play a role. You know, if you've got pain on the bottom of your feet and muscle cramps that are usually worse at night, maybe you're having a hard time sleeping, you may have Bartonella. You know, if you have spontaneous sweating and, you know, anxiety that can progress to panic and panic attacks and maybe depression that progresses to suicidal thoughts or suicidal action, maybe you've got some shortness of breath, that could be Babesia, which is considered the North American malaria. So and there's a number of these infections that you can tell based on your symptoms and your history that may be contributing to what you have going on. But it's never just that. Right. It's always, you know, all these different causes that I'm talking about today. It's always a combination of these. It's never just one, which is a really important point. And then the last thing is trauma. You know, like you don't have to have what we call big T trauma or really significant abuse, whether it's physical, mental, emotional, sexual. You could have little T trauma, which is maybe it's like what I had rejection of a peer group you know, which happened to me a couple times in my life, or whether it's your one of three children like I am, and there's no way that your parents can give enough love to one kid, let alone three kids, right? So there's, these are all ways, you know, we end up adapting to 
to life in in order to survive. And it serves us at the time when we're kids in that family dynamic, but now it's no longer serving us. In fact, it's harming us. So we have to reprogram our brain and we've got a four-step mindset process that we go through and we recommend some of these limbic system and amygdala system uh, retraining programs, which are really helpful, but you got to work on all the fronts, the mental, emotional, physical, spiritual, uh, energetic, different components. Wow. That was a mouthful. Yes, but that was so good. <laughs> Evan, I've I've interviewed hundreds of people. We're almost to 200 episodes. And this is one of the most comprehensive. And I've known about your work, but I am just a, a, a new oppressed uh, and impressed with you as far as just the depth and breadth of your work, the compassion that comes through. Like truly, I am I'm impressed and honored to have you here. And I love, love, love the framework you just laid out, because it's so true. It's interesting in medical school, we taught Occam's razor, which is like the most simplest explanation is usually the right one. And then we get a functional medicine and we're like, oh, no, no, wait, this is actually very, very complex. And I love that you framed it that way, that most everyone out there suffering from fatigue has maybe all five of those things, or you know, likely more than one. Um, just because I think it's so easy to want as a patient, they want one drug, one pill, one easy right. answer. And I kind of want to just be real. You and I know this, it's not easy and you and I have come through it. So it's possible. Um, gosh, I want to dive into long COVID, but I think one thing that bears mentioning is maybe someone listening is like, this is overwhelming. Obviously right. they can get your programs in your book. We're going to mention all of those websites. If you're listening, watching anywhere you can find in the show notes, where to find Dr. Evan. And we'll end with that. But what about hope? Like, how do we give patients hope in this? Um, because it is a long process. We said 12 months. We said you have five or more things going on. What pieces of hope could you give us or give the listeners? So when it comes down to it, it's it can be actually easy from a, from a, if you want to make this as simple as possible. The reality is, is that you find the causes that you have, and then you take the treatment for it. And that's all you have to do. Really, it's just every single day you're asking yourself, okay, what do I need to do today to get better? And if you've got the treatment and then you've got a partner like me or Jill, you d you can ask those questions, you can get those check-ins, you can make sure that you're doing what you're supposed to be doing. But as long as you're addressing all the causes, no stone will be left unturned and you'll be successful at the end of that journey. You know, as humans, we overestimate the amount we can get done in a day and we underestimate the amount that we can get done in a year. And the reality is, is that when you go through this process, at the end of the year, you look back and you're amazed at what you've what you've accomplished. You just have to have that perspective and you have to keep moving forward and you have to make sure that you've got a partner who's going to help you with that. Oh, brilliant. Such good hope. I remember just recently hearing a spiritual advisor talk about two questions. What do I need to know? What do I need to do? I was like, that really fits mm -hmm. with what you're saying there is like, you can do that on a physical level too, on our physical health. What do I need to know? Make sure you guys out there get the right information. That's one reason Dr. Evan and I are podcasting and sharing because we want to get that information out. But then what do I need to do? And the daily habits are really, it sounds like for you too. I always find that those daily, boring, monotonous habits that I have, right? Those are the things that found my faith and my um, health journey. And it's often those core issues that are really making the difference, not some big spa trip for 21 days, right? Yeah. And it's delayed gratification. Yeah. You yeah. know, I mean, you have to understand that what you're doing right now, you may not be feeling it, but it's going to pay off later. Yeah. Great. Okay. Let's shift in our last few minutes. Long COVID you mentioned in your bio. So I know you're dealing with that. Like I am, it's almost like the other elephant in the room <laughs> post pandemic. Um, it's real. Patients are suffering. A Stanford study showed 20% uh, of young people in their 20s were suffering some form of, of symptoms three months or longer, often six months or longer. Are you seeing this? How often is it there? And what else is in the mix with this that we need to think about? It's absolutely there. I'm seeing a lot of it. And I think it's important. It's always got to be in the mix now. Um, and what I'm finding, we're having the most success with people. Yes, we want to remove the spike protein, but they also have the uh, the rest of the toxic five. So the toxic five kind of set the stage. So you already have these toxins that are kind of accumulated in your in your body and in your life. And you were doing fine, though. You didn't have the straw that broke the camel's back, which is essential. Um, and what ends up happening with so many people who end up with chronic fatigue. And so that straw happens. It was introduction of the spike protein, whether it's by vaccination, whether it's by the actual infection itself. And then consequently, the body is not able to remove it because of the toxic five that are present that are 
occupying the immune system and the uh, and the detox pathway. So really important to make sure that those are also being addressed because that's what I'm seeing that's being missed right now. Um, and then of course, so of course, also the microclots and making sure that um, you're using some uh, natural, we like natural, natural fibrinolytics um, in order to make sure that that the um, that the processes of the of the body that need to work are are working better. Mm. Thank you. And thanks for being so matter of fact, because you and I know there are tests out there to show this endothelial disruption, this, the spike protein persistent in the atypical macrophages. And this is very real science-based. It's nothing uh, we know now, right? And we know that right. it can be treated as well. So I'm glad that you're um, including that because I think it takes one more layer, even though it's kind of, you got the foundation there. Um, what is the, let's just say it this way, what would you like to tell your younger self if you could go back and write, you know, during medical school, right before medical school, what do you know now that you wish you would have known then? Um, I think I would just say, you know, keep being curious. You know, I think that um, I wouldn't have really done things differently. I believe that everything has a, has a purpose. You know, I wouldn't be, if I hadn't had chronic fatigue, I wouldn't be specializing it and, and helping other people, you know? So, you know, my mess became my message, right? So I think that, um, you know, continuing to be curious, I think I would have taught myself my mindset practice, you know, having gratitudes every day, envisioning my ideal day, looking at any sort of limiting beliefs that I have, flipping them into empowering beliefs or affirmations and reprogramming my brain, and then asking myself more powerful questions every day, like, how can I love myself more today, right? Or what do I need to do today to, to, to grow um, in different ways, Right. So I think that's probably what I would teach myself. Oh, I couldn't agree more because all those like function medicine things that were like foundation of healing. And then the next level is the trauma, the mindset, the uh, power of positive thinking, the self love and trusting our intuition, all those pieces you just said. So I'm glad we both kind of landed there and now you're teaching. So people want to know more. Where can they find your book? I think you've got an upcoming program. Share with us whatever you have coming up that people might be interested in. So I'm at energymdmethod.com. If you want to text me directly, you can. There's a little text bubble at the bottom right-hand corner there. And if you want to get on a free 20-minute call to see if we're a good fit to work together, we can do that as well. You can see me all over social media. We've got a podcast that Jill's been on. And then you can also click on the, uh, the button for the book, which will take you to Amazon. Awesome. Thank you for the work that you've done. Thank you for taking your suffering and turning it into profound healing for so many people. And thank you just for coming on the show and sharing your heart. Thank you, Jill. Thanks for having me on. You're welcome.